Hi, my name's Karalia with the Yoga Lunch Box, and today I have to say I'm super stoked to be interviewing Leslie Kamenoff. He has been doing yoga for almost 40 years. He began in 1978, um, did his first teacher training in 1979 with the Shivananda tradition, but then met the teacher that influenced him the most in 1987 when he um, connected with Desika Charm. So Leslie also wrote a book called Yoga Anatomy. We co-authored that book in 2002. He founded the Breathing Project Studio in New York City in 2001. Studio opened in 2003. Um, and he's done loads of workshops, loads of things internationally. And he is coming to New Zealand next March to Om Yoga Studio in Auckland, where he'll be del delivering three days of programs, including a teacher training, Anatomy of the Breath, and then also journey to the center of the breast. Leslie, welcome. Well, thank you. That's a lovely intro. You've clearly done your homework. <laughs> you got everything right except one tiny detail. I met Desika Char in 1988 and not at 1987. Uh-huh. But okay. that, was, that was stellar. Oh. I, well, I've spent the last hour and a half literally immersing myself online into, <laughs> I read loads of your blog posts, I read interviews with you. Um, and the more, uh, I, more I read, the more excited. I mean, I was already excited, but I'm so stoked that you're coming to New Zealand because, I mean, frankly, you know your stuff, right? So I get to ask you a whole bunch of questions about it right now. I try um, to know what I don't know, which means I'm always trying to know more. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, in one of your blog posts, you spoke about that, that the way that you're teaching now has evolved more to, to posing questions and to getting students to constantly inquire in and ask questions rather than necessarily thinking you're the guy at the front with all the answers. Well, yeah, it's it's easy to slip into that role. Um, and in some ways, it's uh, uh, more comfortable um, just for me, you know, in terms of my personality as a guy that just likes to know things <laughs> and, and, you know, basing my identity on that. But what I've, what I've learned over the years, especially as an example, um, a following example of, of my teacher, Desika Char, um, is that it, it's far more powerful to engage a student in an inquiry than to simply give them an answer. Or mm. uh, even, you know, in teaching asana, it, it, it applies as well, you know, uh, and that would be um, uh, using the method of what I like to call try this, try that, now see what you notice, mm -hmm. which is an inquiry. As opposed to, okay, we're going to do this, and if you do it right, you're going to feel that. Isn't that great? Um, and mm -hmm. and so uh, it's taken a while to uh, be comfortable with just uh, sitting inside a question, letting students sit inside uh, a space of, of questioning and, and exploration. But what I found is that the answers that people come up with in that situation um, are far more powerful because it's their answers, not anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And that's fundamentally... It that sounds to me like the process of yoga, right? Which isn't about transmitting knowledge, but about helping people to, to, to study like what's going on for them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, because I teach a lot of anatomy too, it, it's, it's easy to slip into the just spewing of information mode, which mm -hmm. frankly, a lot of people want, they just want to have a lot of information thrown at them so that then they can feel like they know that information and, you know, um, and then, you know, they'll, either be safer or more effective teachers. And I found that that it really doesn't correlate very well. You know, I know a lot of people that know a lot of anatomy and I don't find them to be terribly good teachers. And on the other mm -hmm. hand, I, I know some people that are just splendid teachers, amazing teachers, and they couldn't care less about anatomy. My teacher, Desika Char, mm -hmm. you know, in spite of the fact that he was trained as a structural engineer mm -hmm. and was Western in his approach uh, and his education than his father was, Still, when I came to him with these very um, detailed anatomical questions after I first met him, um, he didn't have answers because he, he didn't encode the knowledge that way. It, he wasn't, it wasn't taught to him that way, and he didn't express it that way. He didn't teach using anatomical terminology other than, you know, put your hand here or move your arm or mm -hmm. bend forward at your face. You know, he used, he used body terminology that a four-year-old could understand, basically. Uh-huh. That's he may so have said the word once or twice. I think he may have sort of said the word spine a few times in all the years I've <laughs> studied with him, but that was about it. Yeah. It's interesting because that, that feels very different to what appears to be happening in much of the yoga world now where it seems to have become quite detailed around the anatomy, knowing exactly what's happening on a structural level. 
Yeah, but the thing is, when you go deeply enough into the study of anatomy, you realize that you, you, don't, you don't isolate things when you think you are. Muscles, joints don't work in isolation from the rest of the body. Um, and, and even the structures themselves that we name, you know, like this, this muscle here has an origin, it has an insertion, it has an action, it has an innervation. You look up all this stuff in the book and it's all listed. But, you know, this, this muscle in and of itself doesn't know that about itself. It knows that it's part of it in your body that's dependent on your circulation and your digestion and your respiration and your lymph and, you know, your nervous system, what it's up to. You know, it, it's, uh, we don't have parts, in other words, although mm. we do. We do create parts on a conceptual level and on a physical level with, with incisions, with, with, you know, that's what the word anatomy means. It means to cut up or to cut into something. And, and so it's, it's already a step away from the way things are in life mm -hmm. to, to just aim something uh, as a piece or a part. And it's useful. It's incredibly useful. I'm not saying it's not useful. Obviously, it's useful because we have medicine, we have surgery, we have all these amazing things that we've accomplished through science because of our ability to name things and because of the um, restrictions eventually having been lifted on the study of dead bodies, you know, mm. for, for centuries it was outlawed. So um, we have all these amazing gifts that have come to us from the cutting up of, of, of dead bodies, which is un, un, unmistakable. But yoga is about what happens in living bodies. Yoga is about breathing. It's about movement. It's about life. It's about prana. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and 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 maybe something deeper, something that is much more than the sum of all of those systems and parts. And and so we have to respect that when we're studying yoga, and particularly from an anatomical perspective. And that's something I've learned over the years too. So you're heavily breath focused. Why is that? Yes. Like, I mean, and that's what you teach when you come over. Why the breath? Why anchor there? Uh, well, uh, it's it's a good question because uh, you might you know I. You could say, well, that's arbitrary. Why Why not the digestive system? You know, why not uh, the circulatory system? Why not the nervous system? And then some people do have much more of a focus on those other systems mm. based on what they're interested in. For me, um, breathing is interesting uh, as, a, as a core focus for the study of both yoga and anatomy for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is purely uh, structural. And it has to do with the fact that, that the act of breathing in and of itself has to do with an adjustment of the shape of our body cavities. Mm -hmm. um, and because that's just what the mechanical process of breath is. It's the changing of shape of the body cavities. And the back of those cavities happens to be the spine. Mm -hmm. So the minute we're talking about the process of inhaling and exhaling, we're talking about something that's intimately connected with how the spine changes shape. So then we start asking questions like, wow, so if I want to maximize this, either this range of motion that I'm trying to get out of the spine or this stability I'm trying to derive from the spine, mm -hmm. what is the ideal way to be breathing in order to accomplish that, right? Mm. By the same token, we have some difficulty with our breathing and we want to improve the breathing. And we find that at a certain level, an immobility or instability in the spine is contributing to the breathing. That's a very powerful uh, way of working with these problems. Mm -hmm. um, so on a purely structural level, the mechanics of breathing is fascinating because of its intimate relationship to posture and support mm -hmm. uh, and, and mobilization. Um, on, a, on, a, on a deeper functional level, um, I find that, that the process of breathing is, is intimately connected with how we define yoga as a practice. Because if you think about breathing, um, human breathing, which is a particular form of mammal breathing, by the way, not all mammals have this capacity that we have to voluntarily control our breath mm -hmm. with an intention, with, with, uh. with a willful intention to, to be able to do a certain ratio in pranayama or a certain way of using our nostrils or a certain rhythm mm. or breath, right? We can control voluntarily certain aspects of our breathing and by the same token it's also autonomic it's outside of our control at a certain point so when we're wrestling with um these breathing exercises uh whether it's just purely pranayama or if it's 
something more like a vinyasa with bandhas where we're trying to coordinate breath with movement, mm -hmm. we're, we're th right up into that conversation of what's the relationship between that which I can control mm -hmm. and that which I must surrender to. <laughs> See, yeah. you're in that conversation of Papa, Swadhyaya, and Ishvara Pranidhana uh -huh. when you're in the conversation of breathing. Because tapas is fundamentally about the things that you can change in your system, the things you can, the habits that you can work against. Uh, uh, Ishvara Pranidhana is about that to which you must surrender mm -hmm. because you can't control it. It's powerful than you are. Um, and then the Swadhyaya is this attitude of uh, self-reflection that you bring to this process so that you can distinguish the things mm -hmm. that you can control from the things you can't control. In that sense, it's, it's, it's absolutely identical to Reinhold Niebuhr's Serenity Prayer, which is famously <laughs> used in all those 12-step recovery programs, right? So uh, there's a very, very powerful uh, lesson there that is encoded in the way we as humans breathe. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is the biological, physiological derivation of how we define yoga practice classically. Mm -hmm. So then... So that's why I focus so when we're breathing then, if we look at how we are emotionally responding to life, if we have a tendency to, and this probably happens on the unconscious level, but to suppress emotion or to push it away, is that being controlled via the breath? Absolutely. Uh, you don't just throw a switch in your nervous system that says, oh, I'm not going to feel what I'm feeling now. You know, you have to do something to suppress the the, the sensory spaces in your system in which that emotion arises. You have to change the rhythm, depth, um, uh, and uh, location, really, mm. of your breath motion in order to take yourself away from something you don't want to be feeling. Um, so it's not just like throwing a switch mm -hmm. and turning it off like turning off a light. Uh, emotions are very, very powerful expressions of our aliveness. And in order to to separate ourselves from that experience, we have to do something mm -hmm. actively that is intimately connected with our, our, our breathing rhythms, so which is why people can have so, such breakthroughs in an asana class when they're doing something simple like, you know, going into a stretch or a posture and not holding their breath, not mm -hmm. responding um, sort of habitually the way you would ordinarily respond to a stressful experience. Mm. And as human beings, we seem to be uh, really good at suppressing, repressing, avoiding emotion. But what you're talking about sounds really complex. Like in order to do that, all of these things have to happen on an unconscious level. But it happens without us knowing it. So like how deeply encoded is our desire to avoid suffering? Because that's what's going on, right? Well, I think it gets wired up developmentally with some very, very early patterns. In fact, some of the very first patterns we learn as newborn infants because mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, when, a, when a baby comes into this world, um, it's doing some things that it's never done before, right? Breathing, mm -hmm. fundamentally, is, is uh, a new activity that the baby is doing. <laughs> it's yeah. a brand, every born baby is a brand new breather mm -hmm. because they, there's no air in there and there's no circulation in your lungs when you're in utero, right? And so you're doing this brand new thing called breathing. And then you also immediately have to start doing right after that this brand new thing called um, taking your nutrition in from your mouth instead of your umbilicus. So you're, you're, you're sucking mm -hmm. and you're breathing and swallowing and those have to be coordinated, mm -hmm. right? And each, each, each one of us can only do that for ourselves. And we're not born automatically knowing how to do that. We're born with reflexes that can help us get to that place of coordinating those activities. Um, and some babies don't. Some babies have trouble with that. It, it, it's, a, it's a failure to thrive that happens sometimes with certain infants who need extra help right at the very beginning. So it's, it's not automatic by any means, but it's very deeply ingrained in our reflexive responses. So think about it. You're taking in all of this nutrition now through your mouth mm -hmm. and it's building up inside, right? You're, you're getting full eventually if you're getting enough of it. Now, what happens at that point? This is, again, something else you weren't doing inside mm -hmm. your mother. It's thing you have to do to take the waste away, right? So what we're talking about here is prana and apana. Mm -hmm. Prana is what comes in, and apana is what goes out. 
And again, we're not born automatically knowing that if we squeeze in and push down, this pressure, this pain in our abdomen is going to go away. But we find out very quickly. Because what, what we are reflexively hardwired to do when we are in discomfort is we cry. Mm -hmm. Right? And so think about the action of crying. <laughs> Eventually it turns into downward apana. So that's how deeply wired we are for this squeeze in, push down, make the pain go away thing that we do with our breathing mechanism. Mm. It's, it's, it's with us from the very beginning. And so it's not just poop that needs to leave our body that makes us uncomfortable. It's also other uncomfortable things that arise in our gut mm -hmm. that use this same strategy for. Um, the other problem is the emotions we don't want to feel, we don't get rid of them by pooping them out of our butthole, right? <laughs> this is energy. It doesn't, it, it just, it doesn't go away. It just gets trapped in our muscles. It gets trapped in, in other ways. And this is one of uh, Dr. Arno, for example, uh, is very um, much focused on this. Uh, he wrote some very famous books about back pain and other kinds of pain that have to do with mentally explaining to people that it's their emotional suppressive mechanism that is creating the pain. Because when the muscles are doing this so strongly for so long, they eventually get deprived of oxygen and they start hurting. It's mm -hmm. called ischemia. And it's, it's, not, it's not an injury, it's not life-threatening, but it's very, very painful. Mm -hmm. And um, the way we do this with our breathing and, and, and the way we get out of these painful habits is to learn other habits. In other mm -hmm. words, if I teach somebody a new way to breathe in a yoga class, what they're going to have to do in order to learn that new way of breathing is unlearn their old way of breathing. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. So you said it's not complicated, but it's actually quite simple. You know, the, the, the underlying mechanism by which yoga can help people and what distinguishes it from things like stretching or gymnastics or dance or other things that it may be similar to is this element of the breath. Mm -hmm. When you start to consciously integrate the process of inhaling and exhaling with the process of moving your spine and moving your body, okay, what you're going to run into right away is everything that makes it difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. Those are your habits. Gotcha. And the more you practice thing and the better you become at coordinating these things, the more you have released those habits. And some of those habits are indeed the things we use to suppress our emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's actually the simple mechanism by which all these things work. It's not like the benefit of the pranayama is somehow locked up inside the pranayama and it's liberated when you master it. Right? It doesn't work that way. It's not that way with asana either. Like this asana will fix that problem master the asana, the problem will go away. What it really is, is that if the postural or breathing habit, that the new postural or breathing habit that you're learning is different enough from what you were previously doing, mm -hmm. you improve because you have to stop doing your old habit to learn the new one. Mm -hmm. One of the once you master the new habit, move on to something else because you don't want that to become habitual either. Yeah. That's a good, my teacher would always say that we have to make our yoga practice a little more clever than our habits. <laughs> yeah. and, and just a restatement of the tapas principle. That's just a restatement of, of that principle of tapas. Mm -hmm. Now, you wrote an article in 2014, um, which the, the mere writing of the article seemed to release some really intense back pain that you were experiencing. <laughs> yeah, you read that, huh? I did read that. Yeah, and I, I also read did the um, the uh, uh, interview about that um, on on a on a uh, podcast? Yeah, um, sure. Because I, I I was look just because I teach about this stuff doesn't mean I'm immune from it. Doctor Sarno himself suffered from the thing that he wrote about. You yeah. know, um, so yeah, I I realized uh, this was a little over three years ago now that. At that point, three years ago, I had been holding on to about five years of suppressed anger, rage, grief, loss, and um, upset about mm -hmm. my teacher, Jessica Char's um, loss of his faculties, about his dementia, mm -hmm. and the way it was handled by his family and some of his close students. And I wrote, I wrote an article about it, and, and the, the whole lead up to it was 
that I was more or less incapacitated with back pain at that point. Mm. And it didn't, it occurred to me, it didn't all come together really until I had this very intense dream. And it was all triggered by Iyengar dying. This is when Iyengar was dying. Mm -hmm. And I saw online I saw how some of his students were denying the reality of what was clearly the end of this man's life. And it, it, it triggered this whole thing about Desikachar and how people were in denial about his condition. And so I had a very intense lucid dream and, you know, I started writing down an article, which is essentially just writing down what I was saying in this dream. And, um, and I was in pretty intense spasm at that point. And all the things I would usually do to loosen up my back, um, weren't working. It was just getting worse. And, um, I, uh, finished writing this piece and I showed it to my partner, Lydia, who always reviews and edits things before I release them into the wild, which is a good policy. <laughs> yeah, wise. <laughs> uh, to have somebody who's not you reading your things before you spring them on the world, because sometimes we just don't have the perspective mm -hmm. of what's going on. In this case, I didn't, because she said, you can't release this. And I said, why? I think it's very well written, and I'm just informing the public about Jessica Char and blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, you can't release this because it is filled with rage. Uh -huh. She didn't say anger. She said rage. Yeah. And, 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 and rage is the word that, that uses a lot to describe what's going on with his patients. And the, 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 the astounding thing was, in the moment that the word rage left her mouth and entered my mm -hmm. brain, my back spasm stopped. <laughs> like yeah. the switch being turned off. And that was, you know... That's my Sarno story. Yeah. But we don't know what we don't yeah. know, do we? Well, yeah, but we have to know that there's things that we don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you're right. Even when, we, even when yeah. we're teaching it and even when we're sharing it, that's often we still are unconscious to what we're unconscious of until something reflects it yeah. back to us, shows it to us. Yeah. And I know no better way of getting of – getting underneath that or into that material than just trying to get your mind, breath, and body to do the same thing at the same time. Because what you're going to encounter is everything that wants to get in the way of that, whether yeah. it's structural or physiological or emotional mm -hmm. or spiritual or financial or existential or political. I mean, everything that could possibly be an obstacle in our life will show up when you, when you, do that simple act of just trying to have all of your dimensions mm. doing present at the same place at the same time, <laughs> doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what we ask people to do on the mat, you know, and it doesn't have to be a complicated asana. It can be as simple as raising your arms up and yeah. lowering them down as you're breathing and just working with that. You know, it's, it's simple, simple stuff. Mm. So is there enough focus on the breath in the majority of today's yoga classes? Um, I don't think I, I'm, I'm qualified or inclined to answer yeah. a question like, because you see, I, I take the view that everything that's out there that is having the word yoga attached to it is pretty much okay with me. Mm -hmm. I don't get really upset with things that I think aren't being done the way I would do them. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is, is, is purely mercenary on my part. Um, and that is that, you know, I, I, my subsistence in this life, this is what I do full time. It's, it's what I've been doing full time, pretty much my entire adult life, which is, you know, okay, because I'm really totally unsuitable for any other line of work. <laughs> um, honestly, I would make the world's worst employee, um, I don't want to be my own boss. I would never want someone else to be my own boss, to be my boss. Um, and, and so what I'm saying is that I, I exist on a very, very skinny, skinny section of the overall yoga pie, mm. right? I would be crazy to have an attitude that says that that pie shouldn't keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger mm. because the portion of the pie that I exist on is probably not going to change all that much. But if the pie itself keeps getting bigger and bigger, my little slices and get more and more nourishing. Right. So the more people do with breath, without breath, with goats or dogs or <laughs> you know, 
or I, you know, I, I know all the stuff that's out there. I get my news updates with the word yoga in them. Um, the more of that that's happening, I think the better because number one, it's a free market. No one has the right to say that someone shouldn't be doing it just because they don't agree with it or they think it's stupid or whatever. And at a certain point in most of these classes, something is probably going to happen for a certain number of people who would not otherwise be there <laughs> unless they could be drinking beer or have their cat or their dog or their goat with them. Um, that's going to transform them and they're going to want to go deeper. And mm -hmm. then they're going to maybe find someone like me or someone like the people who come to the workshops that I teach. Mm -hmm. Right. Or the people that are trained by the people that come to the workshops that I teach. You see, so there's always this chance of going deeper. And if the word yoga wasn't attached to these things, then there wouldn't be that, that thread that someone could pull on mm -hmm. and see where it leads. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm the big tent guy. I, you know, you know, do I think some of these things are, are just plain stupid? Yeah. But, you know, do I think I have the right to say that, that it's, that it's not yoga, that, that they shouldn't use the word yoga or someone should stop them? No, nobody has that right. Mm -hmm. It's a free market. I love that. It's so pragmatic and realistic and yeah, that's awesome. Um, diving a little more into bundas because it seems to me from just from what I've experienced out there is there's not a lot of really deep integrated understanding of what the hell a bandha is or how to use it necessarily in a in a class. Do you use it in a moving class or do beginners do it or is it just physical or you know all of these different things? How do you define a bandha? Um, I just think it's a way we coordinate our diaphragms. Uh, our, our, it's a way we coordinate, coordinate the different aspects of our breathing mechanism for particular purposes. And, 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 and like the, the squeezing in and pushing down thing we, we learn to do when we're infants, mm -hmm. to use our breathing mechanism and to coordinate in certain ways for certain purposes is something we've been doing all of our lives. Mm. So my definition of Banda is so broad and so um, integral to how we function in this world that it in, it includes a lot of the things that we're already doing, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, I don't see it as like a uh, an advanced practice or a new practice that people need to be taught. I think it's something that is built into the simple act of moving and breathing at the same time. When you can get that to happen smoothly and evenly, it's because you've discovered something like bandhas in your system. Mm -hmm. So I don't unless unless I'm teaching about them and teaching some of the anatomy around them and, and having a discussion like this, if I'm just teaching a class, I'm not explicitly saying to people I'm, I'm teaching bandhas. What I am asking them to do is to move and breathe in a certain way that's mm -hmm. going to require them to discover something like that or, or to feel something they're already doing. And frankly, I got to tell you, most yoga teachers, I have to work harder to get them to stop doing their goddamn bandhas <laughs> yeah. and to stop doing ujjayi all of the time, mm -hmm. you know, to, to like to rev the system down because if you know if I just taught a whole week on bandhas uh, at um, the breathing project mm -hmm. that was the week I closed the breathing project in New York was the last thing I did was teach this week long immersion about bandhas and on the very first day I, I, I you know I put out this idea that if you cannot connect with these regions of your body your pelvic floor your respiratory diaphragm your vocal diaphragm everything up here if you can't connect with them and know whether you're tensing or relaxing in the first place, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be taught a practice that's about engaging something in a certain mm. way. In other words, don't teach a technique that asks them to engage a structure that they're not capable of connecting with and relaxing in the first place. Because otherwise you're just putting tension on top of tension. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's, it's really not very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be quite harmful in cases. Um, it was for me. When I first learned bondage, I loved the way they felt. I love the way that it affected my posture. I love the energy that it made me feel. You know, mm -hmm. I walked around doing bandhas all the time. And, <laughs> and I actually gave myself a little bit of a hiatal hernia because I created all of this upward pressure and I started yeah. getting acid reflux, which I never had before mm -hmm. until I realized, like, wow, there's all of this upward apana that I'm doing with these bandhas. When's the last time I took a damn belly breath, yeah. you know, and let them go? Yeah. So, you stuck in these things and it can be quite harmful it can be harmful for women if they're trying to give birth mm -hmm. you know 
Don't you think you have to let go of your Malabanda to give birth to a baby? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it sounds stupid when you say it that way, but I'll tell you, a lot of dedicated female Ashtanga practitioners are only faced with that conversation at the, at the very last minute when yeah. their baby's head is trying to crack. And they realize that they've been engaging so much uh -huh. that they're completely incapable of releasing not just the muscle contraction, but the connective tissue in their in their perineum, in their pelvic floor. And I, I know for a fact there has been a lot of very difficult childbirth experiences yeah. from women in that community who have not been coached properly on downward upon it and releasing yeah. the bondage and doing a thousand kegels a day okay you're you're if you're if you're in a stronger pressure doing bondage you're probably not going to have prolapse you're going to have the opposite problem you're going to have an inability for things to move down and out mm -hmm. and it see so these things misapplied can really lead to unfortunate consequences mm. Which nicely seeds into my next question. I mean, I would love to keep talking, but I'm mindful of time, so this might be the last thing that we explore. Um, you you uh. said that asanas don't have alignment. People have alignment. Sure. How, which, that's because asanas don't exist. That's that, 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 that's the more fundamental statement is asanas don't exist. Well, let's right? talk about that. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I yeah. yeah. I, so. What I mean is that there's no such thing as an asana. Mm -hmm. Okay, what there is is a person mm -hmm. who has a body that gets put in a shape, and then you say, "Oh, that's that asana, mm -hmm. right?" Like if you if you put your hands your hands and knees on the floor and raise your butt in the air and push your heels down, that shape will say, "Oh, look, you're doing downward dog," right? Mm -hmm. But you can't then take the downward dog out of your body and look at it here as this entity devoid mm -hmm. of context mm -hmm. and say that it has certain properties or indications or contraindications or whatever, because that's, that's separating the, the concept from the thing in reality to which it is anchored and from which it's derived. Mm -hmm. And so this dropping of context yeah. is a very pervasive thing that people do when they have these conversations. And that's why I say asanas don't have alignment. They, asanas can't have alignment because asanas don't exist unless a person is doing a shape. Yeah. So that's why I say that mm -hmm. people have alignment. Everyone's body is, is a little bit different. Everyone's body is unique. And what works for one person will create harm for somebody else. And engaging someone in an inquiry to discover what their own uniqueness is, I think is mm -hmm. one of the great benefits of asana practice. But if you're coming at it from this idealized sort of, I would say platonic point mm -hmm. of view, because mm -hmm. this separating... Yeah, the form, of, from of the form from the the reality uh -huh. is is platonic. That's the older forms and all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, say I'm much more Aristotelian <laughs> in that sense, <laughs> uh, on, on an epistemological level, right? Um, because uh, this idea that there's some ideal form to this asana that exists in some abstract way, and if I can just get my body to match that form, I will get the benefit is frankly what leads a lot of people into uh, injury, yeah. or at least being very rigid what they're doing. But that shift from yoga being taught, so largely one-on-one, -on -one within context, within a ongoing student-teacher relationship, to group-led classes whereby the teacher very rarely has a relationship with the student, is not teaching to specific bodies, that's what we've seen though, isn't it? Is we've all of a sudden asked it, them, it yeah, and that stopped me dead in my tracks for several years uh, in my career as a yoga teacher because I couldn't figure out how to teach a group practice without it devolving into a, a clinic where I would just work <laughs> with people individually within the group. You know, I'd be cruising along, teaching my thing, and we'd be having fun, and then I'd, I'd make the mistake of actually looking at somebody and seeing what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. And I felt really compelled to respond to what I was seeing. And then the group energy disappears. I'm working with that person. Everyone gathers around, and we're all learning. It's all fun and, and, and enjoyable, but it is no longer a class. It's a clinic. Uh -huh. So I just, I just called it. I was doing clinic for years, and and it was when I to go back to the beginning of the conversation. It was when I really got that my role as a teacher was to lead people in their own individual experiments, and not mm. be responsible personally for each and everything that each and every person was doing. That's when um, I developed a way of thinking about teaching group practice which can work with 10 people or a hundred people or a thousand people. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. because you know, you're, you're doing the try this 
Now try that and see what you notice kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And you're increasing someone's SWAT capacity for swadhyaya. Yeah. And they're to connect with what's going on with their unique body. And as long as you're teaching something that's reasonable, that's not risky, that is uh, approachable by the majority of people, mm-hmm. or, or is at least adaptable enough so that they feel free to make it work for them, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, a small or a large group mm-hmm. because the intent is for each person in the group to connect with what's going on with them, not to just follow the leader or do what the teacher is doing or the person next to them or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 you have to break some very deep samskaras as a, as a teacher to, to get there. It mm-hmm. took me, and, and it also took me uh, uh, many t- instances of, of watching how Desika Char approached this when he mm-hmm. was teaching group practice. You know, um, so he was a very good role model for that. And also mm-hmm. how he dealt with me personally as an individual. He, he was also a very good role model for that. Mm. I know I said it was one last thing, but I, I have to ask this question. What was it like I'm, being with Jessica Char and learning from him, studying with him? How long, how long did you spend? Not, not, not long compared to a lot of other people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when, when I connected with him in 1988, he was still traveling around um, uh, teaching in the West. He would come to the States like every summer. He would be at, uh, on the East Coast at Hamilton uh, University, Hamilton College. And he'd be on the West Coast somewhere else, or you know, mm-hmm. sometimes he was teaching in Europe, and you know, so he was traveling and teaching, and and wherever he was, I made it my business to be there whenever I was able. Yeah, uh, I spent a month of day of daily uh, meetings with him in India back in 1992, um, and uh, other than that, it, it was uh, me just trying to show up wherever he was. He was teaching. I did not do. The thing that people like uh, uh, Gary Kraftsau and some of the other, you know, very senior people like some of the Europeans, very senior people who actually go and live in Madras and, and be there for years or months at a time. You know, I wasn't that kind of student. I couldn't take it. I, not, not only couldn't <laughs> I get away because I already had, already had a studio and a family and I couldn't get away, but I could, even on a weekend workshop, I, I would find myself leaving early. I would find myself coming up with excuses for leaving halfway through the Sunday or something uh-huh. because I would be, I would be full. I would yeah. be mm, overwhelmed with what I had taken in and what I observed mm. and I needed to go off in the corner somewhere and work it out, you know? And so it, that was more like what it was for me, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, which is another, and, and that's, that's certainly, one of the kinds of things people can relate to when they look at, for example, the Yoga Alliance using the metric of hours spent studying to determine someone's qualifications. Now, I don't know any other way to do it, frankly, other than to use that as a starting point, at least in the conversation, mm-hmm. of how many hours you spend studying this and this, and it adds up to something that qualifies you to instruct a class or call yourself a teacher or whatever. Um, but uh, for someone like me, it wasn't the number of hours I spent with Jessica Char. Mm. It was the, um, the degree to which I was really focused on absorbing everything he said and did and how he said and did it. And the few opportunities I had to interact one-on-one with him mm. were so devastating <laughs> to me in many ways <laughs> that I needed the time to get the hell away from him and just work some stuff out. Yeah. I mean, the, the first time I met him in 1988, he ruined my breathing for six months, you know, and I had to make my living as a yoga teacher while I was figuring out how to take a breath again. It was not fun. So I wouldn't have been able to handle like being with him every day all the time, you know, yeah. and I came at it from a very different place in my life than a lot of people. I had already been with the Shivananda organization, I'd already been a Swami with another mm. organization and lived in did all that stuff. And he knew that. He knew I wasn't looking for a guru or uh, a spiritual path or anything like that, you know. Um, and so he treated me accordingly. Mm-hmm. What was the greatest gift that you received from that relationship, those teachings? I can answer that explicitly because I, I said that explicitly to him on the 10 year anniversary of our relationship. I wrote him a letter in 1998 and I was very clear what it was. Um, and I, I thanked him for 10 years as his student. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And what I told him was that um, uh, as much as as much as all the things he said to me um, affected me, what affected me the most was all the things he could have said but didn't. And that was the most powerful because this was a man who, in my estimation, was the keenest observer of a human being I'd ever met. And there was no way I could be in front of him and not feel absolutely completely naked. Mm. Um, and, and knowing full well that not only was he seeing me, but he was seeing all the things that I had spent a lifetime thinking I became, that I'd become good at hiding, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I knew I was being seen. And yet he did not base any of his interactions with me on any of that. He based his interactions on his absolute faith that I could find the answers I needed from within me, not from mm -hmm. anything that he could dish out or, or just give me, you know, uh, uh, pre-digested or whatever. And, and so that respect that he showed mm -hmm. to me and, and in our interactions is, is the greatest gift. And that's to me what I try to, most strongly model my teaching on the way I teach, mm. you know, it's a big, it's a big task to live up to that, but it's a, it's a great gift and it's a very strong um, role model for me. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Leslie, thank you so much for, for the study and the way you've shown up in the last 40 years and for sharing your time <laughs> here in this interview for the last 40 minutes. I really appreciate um, everything you've, you've had to say and to share. Well, you're very welcome, and I so look forward to uh, coming to New Zealand. Um, it is a it is a return trip for me. I was there in in uh, 1984 once. Oh wow! Uh, visited Auckland. Uh huh. Yeah, I was on a, I was on our way to a, a trip to Australia to do a sports medicine conference in Sydney. We uh, stopped off for several days in Auckland and uh, visited some, some friends who um, were living there. We hiked around the Waitakere Reserve. Uh, had a really beautiful time. Went up to One Tree Hill and all that. Is that tree still up there? You know what? I don't even know. <laughs> I've only just moved to Auckland. That's hill. Like, I know. I know. I suspect it might have been taken down. <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to go and see. Now they got. They have to call it No Tree Hill. No tree. Or? I think they might have replanted Something. a few more trees. Hmm. You got to have a tree up there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to my return. It's going to be really lovely and. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, will I get to meet you when I'm there? Yes, you will. I'm so excited about Absolutely. studying with you. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank Perfect. you again. <laughs> My pleasure. Look forward to it.